Welcome back to the Holographic Universe. This is part four of a five part workshop series designed to examine how quantum physics and recent scientific experiments are radically changing our understanding of life, our reality, and our spirituality. In part three, we started building a consciousness model that says, It is your infinite eye not you, that is choosing specific wave frequencies from the field to create each and every one of your holographic experiences down to the smallest detail, and then downloading those frequencies to your brain, which collapses the wave function into a holographic 3D total immersion movie, and then projects that movie out there for you to perceive and react and respond to. So let's explore the model of this infinite eye a little more and talk about the relationship between it and you, the finite eye. But first, let's come up with another name to use instead of finite eye, a name that could better represent who and what we are our relationship to our infinite eye, and why we are here living in a holographic universe. I said before that one of the best clues or hints about how our holographic universe works is our kids' video games. If you've never played one of these games, I recommend going, for free, to Disney's Pirates of the Caribbean Online. What's the first thing you do when you want to play almost any video game? You create a player to play the game for you. And Disney has very amazing technology, at least it's amazing to me, that lets you design your player in great detail, down to the shape of its nose. Your first choice, of course, is what gender you want your player to be, male or female. Then you can choose the shape of the body from five different appearances. And then the height, from short to tall. You can even choose the color of their skin, ranging all the way from pale white to red to brown. Then it's time to focus on the face, ranging anywhere from thin to filled out. And then the width of the face, and the height of the forehead, and the roundness of the face. Now it's time for the jaw, the width, the length, the angle of the chin, the size of the chin, and then the width and thickness of the lips. And we finish working on the face with the cheeks, from fat to thin. You have your choice of eye color, the shape of the eyebrows, and even the spacing of the eyes. Next, it's the size, angle, and position of the ears the length of the hair, and eight different shades of hair color. Then you can choose all different styles and colors of the shirt, vest, belt, pants, and shoes. And now that you've decided what you want your player to look like, down to the shape of its nose, you can give it a name. I know that most parents think they choose the name for their child, but I also know in my case that was not true. My parents wanted to name me Craig, but it was changed at the last minute to Stephen. And I've heard other stories like that as well. I can imagine my infinite eye created me that way as well to play a game, choosing certain wave frequencies from the field to make my body down to the smallest detail including the shape of my nose and my name. But the point is, instead of calling us the finite eye, 
I prefer to call us players for our infinite I. William Shakespeare may have had it right some 400 years ago when he said, All the world's a stage, and all the men and women merely players. We've tried thinking of ourselves a lot of different ways over the years, such as lost souls, fallen angels, sinners that need to be saved, immortal spirits on a quest for perfection, apprentices in training to be gods, kindergartners in the school of life, flesh and blood bodies and nothing else. And most of those ideas haven't worked so well for many of us in terms of bringing lasting peace and joy and satisfaction to our lives. Perhaps we can at least consider the idea that we might be players for our infinite eyes and see where that gets us. At this point, the question often comes up, do I have my own personal infinite eye for whom I am the only player? There is no way to answer that question with any certainty because there is no way for any of us on this side of the field to know what's going on on the other side of the field. Carl Prebrum said our brain was a holographic receiver and translator, and that's all. And Bashar said our personality constructs are simply not designed to do anything except receive wave frequencies and translate them into holograms, and then perceive and react and respond to those experiences. In other words, every experience we have is a holographic experience no matter what kind of experience it is, and whatever goes on on the other side of the field outside our holographic universe is totally unknowable to us, regardless of what the New Age would like us to think about altered states of consciousness. But still, it's an interesting question to speculate about. Do I have my own personal infinite I? Let's look at the two extreme answers. The first answer is that there is only one infinite eye for all the players that exist. This is essentially what God is to most people. And maybe that's true. The other extreme is that every player has its own personal infinite eye, meaning that there are as many infinite eyes over there, on the other side of the field, as there are players here, on this side of the field. There's no question our egos would like us to think we're very special and that we must each have an infinite eye that created us and looks after us and only us. And maybe that's true. But in between these two extremes is what makes more sense to me and is supported by another metaphysical source, Seth, channeled by Jane Roberts. In her Oversoul 7 trilogy, Jane explores the idea that one infinite eye can have a number of players representing it in the game, even different players living at different Earth times, and maybe even players on different planets. Essentially, anything that can happen does happen in one of the alternatives, uh, which means that superimposed on top of the universe that we know of is an alternative universe where Al Gore is president and Elvis Presley is still alive. Physicist Fred Allen Wolf wrote a book called Parallel Universes, The Search for Other Worlds. In that book, he said, what is a parallel universe? Like an everyday universe, it is a region of space and time containing matter, galaxies, stars, planets, and living beings. In other words, a parallel universe is similar and possibly even a duplicate of our own universe. Not only in a parallel universe must there be other human beings, but these may be human beings who are exact duplicates of ourselves and who are connected to ourselves through mechanisms only explainable using quantum physics concepts. The possibility exists that parallel universes may be extremely close to us, perhaps only atomic dimensions away, 
but perhaps in a higher dimension of space, an extension into what physicists call superspace. There is also a theory in quantum physics called the many worlds interpretation, which Dr. Alan Guth referred to in the video you just saw. The Wikipedia explains it this way. Many worlds claims to resolve all the paradoxes of quantum theory since every possible outcome to every event defines or exists in its own history or world. In layman's terms, this means that there is a very large, perhaps infinite, number of universes and that everything that could possibly happen in our universe but doesn't, does happen in some other universe. Prior to many worlds, this universe had been viewed as a single world line. Many worlds rather views it as a many-branched tree where every possible branch of history is realized. So there is speculation among very prominent and respected quantum physicists that other worlds might exist simultaneously with our world and that we might have a connection to them. In short, the many worlds interpretation says that all possibilities occur in one universe or another. Think of it this way. When you turn right in your holographic universe, another player from your infinite eye turns left in a parallel universe. That way, your infinite eye has the chance to experience all possibilities. It would make sense to me that one infinite eye would want to take advantage of all these possibilities to play and express itself creatively and have many players in many lives and in many worlds. This also presents an interesting new twist to past lives, for example. Since we know that space-time is only a function of the hologram and doesn't really exist, perhaps past lives are simply present lives being lived simultaneously by another player from the same infinite eye. And since we share the same infinite eye, we have a connection to that other player, which we are mistakenly calling a memory, through our mutual infinite eye. Personally, I have no problem with the idea that my infinite eye might have other players than just me as brothers and sisters are normally not bothered that their parents have other children. But if you want to think about your infinite eye as your own, that's fine. It really doesn't matter. The possibility that you might share an infinite eye with another player has no relevance or bearing on how you play the game. <laughs>